Hello, everyone. My name is Ariel Roquem, and I'm a research faculty member in the Department of Psychology and eScience Institute at the University of Washington, where I lead a research group in neuroinformatics. The website is uh, down there, and you can read about the work that we do on our website. And I've been a core developer of DiPy for over 10 years now, since about 2011. And in today's presentation, I will talk specifically about diffusion tensor imaging. An outline of the presentation. This presentation will introduce you to ideas from um, modeling of diffusion. Um, I'll make an important first distinction about different kinds of models that we can fit to the data, phenomenological or signal models versus mechanistic or biophysical models. And then I'll talk specifically about one model, the diffusion tensor model. I'll start by introducing this model in 1D, um, the so-called Steskel-Tanner equation, and then I'll talk about how this model was extended into 3D into the settings that we typically use it in diffusion MRI nowadays. I'll talk about de derived quantities from this model and their interpretation, and I'll, I'll close with a few of the advantages and disadvantages of DTI. Along the way, I'll show you how to fit the DTI model in uh, DiPi. But first, an important note about nomenclature. Often you'll hear people talking about uh, diffusion MRI as DTI. And this is uh, fundamentally an error. DTI is one model that explains the diffusion data, one way to interpret the, the diffusion data, but it's not generally diffusion MRI. So when talking about diffusion MRI, generally you should talk about diffusion weighted imaging, DWI, or diffusion MRI, DMRI, not DTI. What are models for generally? Models are tools for inference. Models allow us to make inferences about the data through a variety of perspectives. One perspective is that a model allows us to reduce the data, summarize the data by boiling it down, by boiling many, many measurements down to a few, a small number of parameters. Another perspective is that the model endows data with specific meaning. It gives us an interpretation of the data. A machine learning or statistics perspective says that a model allows us to predict other data. So if we fit our data to some data, if we fit our model to some data, we might be able to predict some other kind of data or, or some other data measured with similar means. Finally, and importantly, a model allows us to create a theory of the data. It allows us to explain our results. There are different classes of models, and I'll talk about uh, two broad classes of models that you can uh, use in order to interpret diffusion MRI data. The first are phenomenological models. These are models that only represent the observable properties of their targets and refrain from postulating hidden mechanisms. In contrast, mechanistic models do postulate hidden mechanisms. For example, you might have a model that postulates the density of the neural tissue within a voxel, even though that's not an observable uh, property of the, the, the measurement of the, of the data. Each class of, the mo of models has its own advantages and disadvantages. Phenomenological models can be quite ambiguous, and we'll talk about that in the context of DTI, which is a phenomenological model. On the other hand, mechanistic models require a lot of assumptions. You need to assume how these mechanistic properties, the biophysics of the tissue, becomes the signal that you measure. So let's talk a little bit about how the, the data comes about in um, diffusion MRI, um, and then we'll talk about how this this, uh, these properties of the measurement become the model uh, diffusion tensor imaging model. So this is the pulse gradient spin echo experiment. Uh, this is a, a schematic that describes uh, how this uh, experiment plays out. Uh, it includes uh, two pulses uh, of RF energy injected into the, uh, the sample as the sample is inside the magnet, the sample meaning uh, someone's brain usually in our, in our experiments. Uh, first a 90 degree uh, pulse, um, this is this is again this is a spin echo experiment. So um, during the, the evolution of the, the spin echo, we uh, give the the the, um, the sample one RF pulse ninety degrees, um, and then uh, one gradient is played out. That gradient has some strength and some duration. Then we wait for a little bit longer, give another one hundred and eighty degree pulse, and then play out the same gradient that we did here. Now the effect of that uh, combined. Uh, RF set of RF pulses and gradients, what it usually does is that if the water molecules, the, the protons that we're measuring the signal from here, haven't moved at all, the first um, pulse and gradient should cause a dephasing of their signals, while the second pulse 
end gradient should cause a precisely a rephasing of the signal. That assumes that the molecules haven't moved at all. But if the molecules move along the uh, axis on which the gradient is applied, then we will see a loss of signal. here, And it is this loss of signal that we use in order to model uh, diffusion. Now, Steskel and Tanner, back in the 1960s, um, they came up with this equation that describes the signal loss as a function of all these parameters. So there are multiple parameters. This is decaying exponentially e to the minus, and there's all these parameters that include the uh, temporal difference between the gradients, the small delta, the duration of the gradient, the amplitude of the gradient squared, and also the gyromagnetic ratio of the proton molecules that we're measuring from. And then d is a single parameter that is the diffusivity of um, the, the protons in the, in the sample that we're measuring in. And then subsequently, people took and summarized all of these uh, measurement parameters down into one number, b. So the Steskel-Tanner equation then eventually boils down to e to the minus bd, a decaying exponential. Now, in cases where uh, we measure in 3D instead, we might be getting different signal decay in different directions. That means the diffusivity is different in different directions. If uh, the diffusion is isotropic, as in this, uh, in this video here, um, we'll get the same signal decay in all directions. But inside of our white matter, um, in bundles of axons that are tightly packed together, um, the diffusivity of the water is more, the diffusion of water is more readily measured along the length of the axons than across the axons, meaning there's more signal loss along the length of the axons than across the axons. Um, so if we're measuring uh, diffusion in, with multiple different values of this measurement parameter B and in multiple different directions, um, here, you know, multiple different measurements, then this might be 100 measurements, 150, 30, um, we can model the diffusivity in multiple different directions. Here's an example of diffusion data measured. So here, what I'm doing is I'm, this, this is all measured with a single B value, B value of 2000. And here, what I'm doing is I'm rotating the gradient around and you can see how the signal changes in different voxels in the white matter, depending on the direction of the, the gradient. This is what actual diffusion MRI data looks like. What diffusion uh, tensor imaging allows us to do then is to model this change in diffusivity in different directions. It captures the way in which the diffusivity varies in different directions. So this is the signal, the diffusion signal measured in one single voxel in the uh, corpus callosum in, one, in 150 different directions. Each point here represents one direction of measurement. And what we'd like to do is we'd like to take all of these measurements and summarize them as a tensor, a diffusion tensor as the name implies, is modeled as a, um, a uh, three by three tensor. And the way that this model works is um, there are six parameters, six independent parameters. Uh, the parameters on the diagonal here are the diffusivity along the principal axes. And then the off diagonal parameters, sigma yx, sigma zx, and sigma zy, are the covariance uh, parameters that model the diffusivity uh, the interaction. And so this allows us to model a three-dimensional diffusivity tensor in any direction uh, in 3D. So here's, here's a, 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 the model as fit to these data. This tensor then is expressed, you could express it as this kind of ellipsoid that uh, tries to summarize these data with six parameters, 150 measurements summarized in uh, six parameters. So here, uh, here are the equations that, or here's the equation that describes this then. Uh, the steskel tanner equation is now expanded into Q. Uh, instead of one parameter D, we now have six parameters that are summarized as a three by three matrix Q. And in each direction that we're measuring, we uh, project this tensor down onto the direction of measurement. And that gives a single number D, which is the diffusivity in that direction. And so it gives us uh, uh, an estimate of the diffusivity in that direction. And so Q summarizes the diffusivity in all directions. Um, one additional thing that we do is we measure also measurements that are not diffusion weighted, the B zeros, and we normalize to those measurements. This is to take account into account differences in uh, 
just overall signal magnitude in different parts of the brain or uh, sensitivity, differing sensitivity of the measurement coils in different parts of space. The, the model is solved by taking log of both sides on both sides of this equation. So take the log of the ratio of the diffusion weighted measurement to the non-diffusion weighted measurement. And that's then a um, linear set of equations. And we fit that as a weighted linear model. Um, once we have um, the tensor, we do an eigen decomposition that gives us three principal eigenvector and eigenvectors or three, three eigenvectors and uh, three eigenvalues of this tensor. Uh, this is so that we can derive other properties from the diffusion tensor. For example, if we take these three eigenvalues of the tensor and we average them, that tells us what is the mean diffusivity overall in all directions. If we take a normalized variance measurement, or we take these, these, um, uh, um, these eigenvalues and we take the square difference from the mean diffusivity for each one of them, and we uh, normalize that by the sum of the squared variances of the eigenvalues multiplying by square root of three over two, that gives us a, 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 a scalar, a single scalar number in each voxel called the fractional anisotropy. The reason for this complicated formula is that this is a number between zero and one. When the eigenvalues vary a lot, when the, the tensor is very, very anisotropic, meaning the eigenvalue, the first eigenvalue of the tensor is much, much higher than the second or third eigenvalue. This means that the diffusion is really, really oriented towards the uh, principal eigenvector of the tensor, the first eigenvector of the tensor, and there's not a lot of diffusion in other directions. And so the diffusion is very, very anisotropic, and the fractional anisotropy will be very close to one. When all the eigenvalues are identical, when there's all the same diffusion in all three of the um, eigenvector directions of the tensor, uh, that means that diffusion is very, very isotropic, and the fractional anisotropy will, will go towards zero in that case. So here's a map of mean diffusivity in the brain. You can see that mean diffusivity is very large in the ventricles, where the water is is uh, can is allowed or is is, is 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 can diffuse in in multiple different directions a lot. Uh, in the white matter, uh, diffusion is much much more constrained. There's less diffusivity, so this gives us an estimate a little bit tells us a little bit about the tissue properties. Fractional anisotropy similarly is very very high in big bundles of white matter where diffusion is constrained by the myelin and by the packing of the axons together and by the, the density of the tissue in those locations. And that's locations in which the fractional anisotropy is very close to one. In contrast, in the ventricles and the gray matter, diffusion is similar in all directions and you get a very low fractional anisotropy. The tensor also gives us one more uh, kind of derived property that's useful, which is the principal diffusion direction. That's the direction of the first eigenvector of the diffusion tensor, and that gives us a, a broad estimate of the, um, the direction of, uh, uh, or the average direction of axons within uh, each location is used as a cue, as a cue for tracking uh, using uh, the diffusion tensor. Here's how you'd fit uh, DTI with DiPi. So um, in this example, we start by, by fetching some data, the Stanford Hardy data set into, um, a directory you need to specify here the out directory um, you can say out directory with with any with nothing here and then it will it will copy the data right where you are um, then uh, we generate a rough brain mask here using the dipi median otsu command line interface uh, pointing to the data um, we need to give it a few more um, a few more um, arguments here in order to tell it where to save the mask and then finally, we can fit the DTI, giving it the data, the B values and the B vectors, and pointing to the mask with the, the outer. If you run this, then you will get a few outputs, including the fractional anisotropy, mean diffusivity maps, and the parameters of the, of the tensor. Some pitfalls of DTI. So we talked a little bit about DTI. Uh, it's used very commonly in making inferences about group differences. Uh, those parameters, mean diffusivity, fractional anisotropy, and other parameters that you can derive from it are quite useful. But it's important to know that it is not, does not, the signal doesn't well represent crossing fibers. So if there are two fiber populations, 
the, the principal diffusion direction will be the average of the directions of these two fiber populations and not representing any of these. Uh, there's also issues of ambiguity. I mentioned DTI is a phenomenological model. So the connection with the underlying biophysics of the tissue can be ambiguous. For example, FA can change because of many different factors. Myelination of the tissue versus demyelination of the tissue increased or decreased fractional anisotropy, but also fanning or crossing of fibers that can cause a decrease in FA just as demyelination and pa partial volume with other tissue compartments that can also cause a uh, decrease in FA. All of those factors cause a decrease, the same, the same effect, the decrease in FA, and you can't really tell which one is happening when you have a particular decrease in FA. You can't disambiguate this. So you wanna avoid making strong mechanistic claims based on the mechanistic model. You could say this group differs from this group in their fractional anisotropy, but it wouldn't necessarily be right to say this group differs in their white matter integrity from this group based on a difference in FA because they might differ in the fanning or crossing of fibers, which could hardly be construed to be white matter integrity. Okay, and with that, I'll close. Uh, I'd like to thank all the various funding agencies that uh, fund our work. And I'd like to invite you again to uh, go to my group's uh, webpage and see the kind of work that we do.